Okay, discussion 2.2, nuclear radiation and half-life. So in this discussion, we're going to talk about what radioactivity is and talk about the process of radioactive decay. We're going to characterize alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. Um, we're going to talk about some uses for radioisotopes and use half-life information to determine the amount of a radioisotope remaining at a given time. Okay, so what is a radioisotope? So here we have our famous table of proton, protons, electrons, and neutrons in mass number. So what I have here is two stable isotopes, nitrogen-14 and helium-4, and a whole bunch of unstable isotopes. So if I look at the ratio of protons to neutrons in the stable isotopes, I see that I have equal numbers of protons and neutrons in each. If I look at the unstable isotopes, I see I have a different number of protons and neutrons in each. So that is what makes a radioisotope, an unstable isotope, is a difference in the number of protons and neutrons. So there's our definition. A radioisotope is an isotope with an unstable nucleus. It's unstable because it has different numbers of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. Now a radioisotope can become stable by emitting a variety of particles. We call these emitted particles radiation. So here we have polonium-210, it's becoming more stable by spitting out something called an alpha particle. Carbon-14 can transmute into nitrogen-14 by spitting out something called a beta particle. So let's talk about this radiation. We have three types of radiation that we're responsible for knowing about alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays. So alpha particles will have a symbol for helium. It will have the mass number of four, and an atomic number of two like helium has. Now the composition of an alpha particle is actually just the nucleus of a helium atom. So it's the two protons and two neutrons of a helium, of a helium atom without the two electrons, it's just the nucleus. That gives the alpha particle a charge of plus two for the two protons. As far as radiation goes, it's rather large and um, their alpha particles are so large they can just be stopped by air. So beta particles, their symbol is a lowercase e. They have a mass number of zero and an atomic number of minus one. Now their composition is electrons. That's why we give the beta particle the little e as a symbol. Now electrons we know have a, char have a charge of minus one and compared to alpha particles they are gonna be very small. Now beta particles can travel through air but they can be stopped by something as thin as a piece of paper. And finally gamma rays we have the lowercase Greek letter gamma, which kind of looks like a little fish diving down, sort of, or a Y, uh, with a mass number and an atomic number of zero. So the composition of gamma rays is pure energy. It's not really a particle at all. It does not have a charge associated with it, and it really does not have a size associated with it. So you can assume that gamma rays are super duper small. Now gamma rays can only be stopped by lead. Now you may notice, you may remember if you've ever had an x-ray or when you go to the dentist to get the x-ray, they put that heavy vest on you. That's to prevent you from absorbing too much radiation, too much gamma radiation while they zap you with x-rays. All right, so where in the atom does decay originate? Now we're talking about nuclear chemistry here. So these decay processes originate in the nucleus. Now what is conserved in a nuclear reaction? Mass will always be conserved. What does that mean? That means that the mass will always stay the same during a reaction. If you have 10 units of mass before the reaction, you'll have a new substance that has 10 units of mass in the, um, after the reaction. So here we have an isotope plutonium-240. Now plutonium-240 is going to undergo alpha decay. That means it's going to spit out an alpha particle. Now since an alpha particle has a mass of 4 and an atomic number of 2, the product that forms, uranium-236, will have a mass that is, uh, that is 4 units less than the mass of the original isotope. And it'll have an atomic number that is 2 units less than the original isotope because we spit out uh, 4 units of mass and 2 protons. Now if you look at both of the products of this particular process and add them up, 4 plus 236 will give us a total mass of 240 and 92 plus 2 will give us a total atomic number of 94. So nothing changes from either side of the equation. All the masses are the same, all the atomic numbers are the same. So here are some um, equations for radioactive decay. Now this was too much of a pain to fill in uh, with the PowerPoint, so I'm going to do this with my document camera and my periodic table. So when we look at 
part A. I have uranium-238. Now, in order to complete these equations, I need to have all the atomic numbers. So I'm going to get the atomic numbers from the periodic table. I look at uranium down here, and I see it has an atomic number of 92. So I'll write in 92 down there to indicate that. Thorium on the periodic table is right near uranium, and has a, it has an atomic number of 90. So I'll write in the atomic number of 90. Now the whole idea here is that the mass and atomic number has to be equal on both sides. So on this side we have three different particles. All three particles have to add up to a mass of 238 and an atomic number of 92 since this is the only particle on this side of the equation. So I have a thorium-234 and I have another particle that has a mass of zero. That means the mass of this missing particle must be four so that all three of them add up to 238. Now I know the particle with a mass of four, if I look back at my table of the three types of radiation, the particle with a mass of four is an alpha particle. So I know that an alpha particle is being emitted. Now, since the alpha particle has a mass of two, or an atomic number, excuse me, of two, these two atomic numbers combine to 92. That means this radiation must have an atomic number of zero which means it's gamma. That's basically what we're doing here. We're just going to fill in the missing particles by determining what mass and atomic number they should have. So if I look at the atomic number for carbon-14, I see that carbon has an atomic number of 6, and nitrogen has an atomic number of 7. Now, we have one particle over here with a mass of 14, and we have two particles over here that will combine for a mass of 14. Since nitrogen-14 already has that mass, the mass of this particle must be 0. Now, since the atomic number over here is 6, the total atomic number over here needs to be 6. Now, nitrogen has an atomic number that's greater than 6, so the thing we need to add to 7 to make it 6 is negative 1. And the particle that has a mass of 0 and an atomic number of negative 1 is a beta particle. All right, I'll do one more, and then I want you guys to fill in all the rest on your own. So thorium is still 90, just like it was up here. Radium, if you look on the periodic table, is 88. This is atomic number of 88. Now I see here the mass is 230. That means these two particles have to combine for a mass of 230. Since this particle is 226, this one has to have a mass of 4. Same thing with the atomic number. The atomic number over here is 90, which means it needs to be 90 over here. Since that particle has an atomic number of 88, this particle has to have an atomic number of 2, which makes it an alpha particle. All right, so pause the video and see if you can work out the rest on your own, and then I'll just go through them quickly. Okay, so polonium is right up here. It has an atomic number of 84. And we know that helium has an atomic number of 2. This is actually an alpha particle. So the total mass here is 218. Since the mass of helium is 4, the mass of this particle must be 214. And since the atomic number here is 84 and the atomic number of helium is 2, this must have an atomic number of 82. So to find the symbol, we have to find the element with an atomic number of 82. And we see that it's Pb, which is lead. So we'll write in the symbol for lead. Here we have our good pal thorium again. Thorium has an atomic number of 90. And Pa is protactinium, which is right there, has an atomic number of 91. So I'll write in 91 next to protactinium. So here we have 231 and 231, so the mass of this missing particle is 0. Here we have an atomic number of 90, and here we have an atomic number of 91, so we have to add negative 1 to that to make it 90, and this makes this a beta particle. Finally, zirconium 97. Zirconium is right here somewhere in the middle. Where are you? Where are you, zirconium? There you are. Atomic number of 40. So I'm going to write that in my equation right there. Now that's going to spit out a beta particle. Since the beta particle has no mass, the mass of this missing element will be 97. And since this is a beta particle, minus 1 plus 41 will make 40. And the element with an atomic number of 41 is niobium, which is Nb. And that is how you do the nuclear equations. This is something you can practice. Once you get the hang of it, you're going to find it's not that difficult at all.
So some general rules for nuclear equations. The sum of the mass number on the left must be equal to the sum of all the mass numbers on the right. And the sum of the atomic numbers on the left have to be equal to the sum of the atomic numbers on the right. If you see the term alpha decay, it means that an alpha particle will be a product, which means that whatever excuse me, isotope is undergoing alpha decay will create a brand new element. So the mass number of an alpha particle is four and the atomic number is two. If something is undergoing beta decay, that means it's going to spit out a beta particle and another element. The mass of the beta particle is zero and the atomic number is minus one. Finally, gamma decay means that a radioisotope is emitting gamma radiation, which means it will lose zero mass and lose zero atomic number. All right, so half-life. The question says, when does a sample of a radioisotope stop decaying? And the answer to that question technically is never. Now, we measure the rate of radio or, um, radioactive decay with something called half-life. Half-life is the amount of time it takes for one half of an isotope to decay into another element. If the half-life for something is 10 minutes, every time 10 minutes goes by, the item will lose half of its mass. So we can determine half-life two ways, from an equation and from a graph. So let's first look at a graph. Now here we have on this graph activity counts per second on the y-axis. What that really means is the amount of substance remaining. And on the x-axis we have time. So the first thing we're going to need to do if we're going to determine half-life is to find the point on the y-axis that represents half of the item decayed. So at time equals zero, before decay starts, we have, a, a, we have a, an amount left of 80. So the half-life must be at the point where 40 or half of 80 remains. Step two, we're going to trace a line out to the curve and see where the intersection point on the, on the curve falls on the x-axis. Wherever it falls on the x-axis, that's your half-life. So we'll trace out to the curve, trace down to the x-axis. We see it's just about between 4 and 8, so our half-life is approximately 6 days. Now here's the equation for half-life. The half-life is the total time duration of decay divided by the number of half-life cycles, which we can represent with arrows. So the time duration, again, is the amount of time the isotope has been decaying. We can determine the number of arrows by seeing how many half-life cycles it takes to decay to a certain mass. And you'll see what we're talking about in the next problem. But in most cases, these problems are going to require two steps. One step is going to be plugging the numbers into the equation. The other step is going to be figuring out how many half-life cycles or how many arrows we have to draw to make it fit the problem. So what does that mean? Well, let's take a look. So you have three gram sample of nitrogen 13. It takes 40 minutes for the sample to decay to 0.1875 grams. What is the half-life? So here's our equation. We're asked to calculate half-life, so we're going to need the time and the number of half-lives. Well, it tells us it's been decaying for 40 minutes, so we have the time. Now we just have to figure out how many half-lives. Well, we're not given the number of half-lives directly in the problem, but we are given a starting mass and a final mass. Now, when we're drawing our arrows, one arrow will be equal to one half-life cycle. So let's start at three and see how many arrows it takes to get to 0.1875. Well, after one half-life, half of the sample will remain. So after one half-life, we'll have 1.5 grams left. After two half-lives, we'll have 0.75 grams. After three half-lives, we'll have 0.375. And after four, we'll get to our 0.1875. So when we fill in the equation, our half-life, the time is uh, 40 minutes, excuse me, and it took one, two, three, four half-lives to get there, so the half-life is 10 minutes. Now this one's a little bit simpler. It says how much of a 16 milligram sample of gallium will be left after two half-lives? Well, it's telling us how many arrows there are, and it's giving us a mass, a starting mass of the sample. So after one half-life, there'll be eight milligrams left. And after two, after two half-lives, there'll be four milligrams left. Really easy to solve that problem if you know what you're looking at when you read it. Try this one all on your own. It says, if the half-life of iodine-131 is 8.10 days, how long will it take a 50-gram sample to decay to 6.25 grams? So write down your equation, see what is missing from the equation, figure it out, and plug in the numbers and solve. All right, so here's our equation. Half-life is time over arrows. Right, so I ha I'm given the half-life in this problem. Right, and I'm asked to find the time duration. If I want to find the time duration, I have to determine how many half-lives it takes to go from 50 to 6.25. So let's find out. After one half-life, we'll have 25 grams remaining. 
After two half-lives, 12.5. After three, we get to 16.25. So three is what we plug into the bottom of the equation. To solve, we're going to multiply 8.1 by 3, and we get that um, it's going to take 24.3 days for this to occur. Okay, so some uses of radioisotopes. Make sure you know at least one radioisotope and its use. So carbon-14 and uranium-238 are used for radiometric dating, or radiocarbon dating specifically if we're talking about carbon-14. Now, the way that works is we know um, how quickly a radioisotope will decay into a new element. So for carbon-14, Carbon-14 is taken in uh, in the air that we breathe, in the carbon dioxide. So once an animal stops breathing, that carbon-14 will begin to decay. When the animal is discovered, we can look at the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 in the bones or whatever, and we can determine how old it is. Now, the, because the half-life is 5,700 years, it only works for things that are about 50,000 years old, because after a while, there will be so little carbon-14 left that it's too difficult to detect. Uranium-238 has a much longer half-life, 4.46 times 10 to the ninth years, or 4.5 billion years, basically has a half-life of the age of the Earth. So that is used to date much older things like rocks. All right, now, cobalt-60 is a beta emitter, meaning it undergoes beta decay, and it's used for disinfecting fruits. When a sample of cobalt-60 is placed uh, near uh, strawberries, the alpha, the beta particles flying out can help to kill any um, uh, microorganisms on the outside of the fruit, but it doesn't leave any nastiness behind like pesticides do. Phosphorus 32 has a number of applications, but one of them is biological tracing. In the image here, we see the phosphorus 32 being input into a plant. As it travels through the plant, you can actually uh, use a device called the Geiger counter uh, illustrated here to actually see where the phosphorus 32 is going. Um, in people, they can actually do this to determine where blockage is in people's arteries because they can input the phosphorus 32 in your body and in your bloodstream and they can watch it go all the way through your bloodstream. Wherever it gets caught up in your body um, will tell them where blockage is. Now we can see the half-life of phosphorus 32 is 14.3 days now, you don't necessarily want something that's emitting beta particles inside your body because it can damage your organs, but since it's got such a short half-life, it doesn't stay in our bodies for too long, and so it's not really dangerous to us. Americium-241 is an alpha emitter, and that is used in smoke detectors. I actually think this is really cool because you have a little radioisotope decaying, spitting out alpha particles in your house right now. And the way a smoke detector works is there's a constant stream of alpha particles coming out of that americium-241 at a constant rate. And, is, and there's a detector in the smoke detector, and as long as the alpha particles are hitting the detector, the device is happy. It's only when smoke gets into the smoke detector, it blocks the alpha particles from hitting the detector, and that makes the thing freak out and make a bunch of noise. So I think that's actually pretty cool. Other uh, medical uses for radioisotopes? Iodine-131, with a half-life of eight days, is used to treat and diagnose thyroid conditions. Um, they use iodine-131 because of its short half-life, um, but it's, got, it's so radioactive that when people are given this treatment, they have to actually be quarantined because they're basically walking around all being all radioactive. Uh, iron-59 is used to determine iron metabolism and red blood cell count. Sodium-24 is used to test electrolyte levels in people. And cobalt-60, in addition to being used to um, disinfect fruit, is also used for cancer treatment. All right, so finally, I want you to practice determining the half-life for thorium-234 by looking at this graph. So pause the video and do that. All right, so the first step is to trace down to where um, half remains. So we started out at 100%. So 50% is half. So we'll trace the line from 50% out to the curve, see where that intersects the y-axis. It's right between 20 and 30, closer to 30. So I'll say it's approximately, the half-life is 28 days. All right, that's it for discussion 2.2 two and unit two. Make sure you watch these videos, bring any questions you have to class and study hard for your test, which is going to be next week. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you in class.